We have kind of a tag team group here. So first, David Bowling from the NTSB is going to talk about what you do need to report. Um, then Mike Voorhees is going to talk about, he's, he's kind of mined the database working from the NTSB while they're working on another project. And he's going to talk about some of the things he's seen in the NTSB reports. And then Rob Schantz, who is now an independent but is, uh, you know, has a lot of experience in the, in the aviation insurance business for balloons. He's going to talk about things that have happened that ne aren't necessarily reportable to the NTSB, but, but do affect your insurance. So if everyone will, will settle down, we'll have David come up. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, most of you folks know me. I'm David Bowling. I'm uh, Regional Chief for the NTSB's Office of Aviation Safety Central Region, headquartered out in Denver, Colorado. For the short time I have with you today, I'll be talking about the NTSB balloon accident investigations and what makes an event an accident. I'll talk a little bit about the role of the NTSB very briefly. Why do we investigate balloon accidents? what is and what isn't considered substantial damage and what's a reportable event in a balloon accident and can taxi incidents become accidents and then what can we learn from all of this okay boom there we go so what role does the NTSB play in transportation safety well we're one of the federal agencies entrusted to safeguard the nation's transportation systems our roots might not go back as far as this cartoon that Gary Hart alludes, but ever since commercial aviation took to the air and had accidents, we've been involved in solving the whys of the accidents and the hows of stopping similar accidents from happening. And you've seen this slide before because I use it just about in every presentation I do. The NTSB's mission, very basic. We prevent transportation accidents from happening by investigating the accident, determining the most probable cause of those accidents, and making recommendations designed to prevent similar accidents from happening again. And this includes balloon accidents. Why? Because balloons are a transport vehicle and not exempt from accidents that take lives. By now, all of you have seen these photos and read the report on the Lockhart, Texas, Cubasec BB-70, Heart of Texas ride balloon accident, where the pilot and 15 passengers lost their lives on June 30th, 2016. I think we can all agree that there are balloons that equate to the size carriage of a small commuter aircraft and are operated by professional companies whose purpose is to provide aviation for revenue, be that revenue for sport or for other purposes. And when such vehicles crash and injuries result, the why of it the why it happened needs to be investigated. But in spite of Lockhart, however, ballooning is still the safest facet of aviation. It wouldn't be a government presentation if I didn't show you some statistics. So here are some with regards to ballooning when compared with all aviation looking at the last 10 years. For all aviation accidents in the United States over this 10-year period, there were 14,332 accidents. And this is mine from the NTSB database, which all of you can go on and take a look. All Part 91 general aviation accidents, there were 12,448. And of those, 2,444 were fatality accidents. Now, of that 14,342 accidents, there were 106 hot air balloon accidents. And of those, seven fatal accidents. But 24 people lost their lives in those accidents. And of course, Lockhart makes up for a large percentage of that. So what is your overall accident rate in relation to general aviation? Less than 1%. So the ballooning community is a relatively safe form of aviation when compared with all other aviation out there. So what makes something like this a balloon accident? Is this an accident? 
Well, we're going to come back to this. So, our Bible is Title 49, Code of Federal Regulations, Part 830. Those of you who are private pilots, you may have taken the private pilot examination. You probably get the two questions about when do you report an aircraft accident to the National Transportation Safety Board. This is the part, the federal regulation, that covers all of this. And there are some key definitions that you should know about Part 830 because this is what the NTSB uses to determine whether an event or an occurrence is an accident or not. First of all, the definition of an aircraft accident is an occurrence associated with the operation of an aircraft which takes place between the time people get on that aircraft with the intention for flight and end when they disembark that aircraft and in which any person suffers death or serious injury or if the aircraft receives substantial damage. So you can actually have an accident with no injuries or fatalities, but if the aircraft is damaged, it's an accident. Fatal injury, let's see, sorry about that. There's the definition and fatal injury, which is another definition, the NTSB determines is any injury which results in death within 30 days of the accident. So you can be seriously injured at the accident hang on for three weeks, and if you perish, then we're going to do an accident investigation. An incident means an occurrence other than an accident associated with the operation of an aircraft, which affects or could affect the safety of operations. You can have an occurrence that does not damage your aircraft, that doesn't result in any injury, but the circumstances around that, that occurrence is so interesting that the NTSB may do an incident investigation on it if it's reported to us. And the reason we do that is because we're collecting data to maybe make safety recommendations to help an entire industry or an entire area of aviation be safer. Talking about serious injuries, this means any injury that requires hospitalization for more than, seven, more than 48 hours commencing within seven days of the date of the injury when it was received. So after seven days, if all of a sudden something happens, we wouldn't consider that a serious injury. Results in a fracture of any bone except simple fractures, fingers, toes, and the nose. Causes severe hemorrhages, nerve, muscle, or tendon damage. Involves any internal organs or involves second or third degree burns or any burn affecting more than 5% of the body. So that's the fatality and the serious injury side of what might constitute an accident. The other side is substantial damage, which means damage or failure which adversely affects the structural strength, performance, or flight characteristics of the aircraft and which would normally require major repair or replacement of the affected component. Now, it talks about a whole bunch of things here that would not be considered substantial damage. Engine failure. You don't have engines, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay, limited to only one engine. If you have two engines, well, you don't have any engines. Bent fairings or cowlings, dented skin. Small punctured holes in the skin or fabric is probably the only part of this that might specifically pertain to balloons. Ground damage to rotors or propellers, damage to landing gear. Most of this stuff was written for fixed wing and helicopter aircraft. Okay, so when do you report an accident? Part 830.5 says the operator of any civil aircraft shall immediately and most expeditiously notify the nearest NTSB office when... Yeah, none of you can read this. I'm going to tell you your homework assignment is to go get part 830 and read this. What all of these things are are things that happen to you that you would notify the safety board of. Does not necessarily mean you have an accident or an incident. It's something that happened to you. One of the big things we're looking at now is screen blanking and electronic flight control or flight displays on some of these more modern commercial aircraft that are using the screens for all of their avionics. When you get screen blanking and you get the big X across the screen, we sort of want to know about it. 
Are we going to do an investigation on it? We may collect some data to help us with, you know, a continued trend that we might be seeing, but probably not going to be an accident investigation. Probably the one thing up in this big list that, prob that pertains to ballooning is if you have incapacitation of a pilot or key crew member during flight. That's a reportable event. Might not do anything about it, depending on how the outcome, you know, after the event happens, what the outcome is, but, you know, it's something that we want to know about. Okay, one more. Okay. And then what constitutes a balloon accident? What information would you give in that particular notification when you call the NTSB? Well, probably the things you'd want to, you know, anybody would want to know. What's the make and model of the aircraft? What's its registration number? Who is the operator? What's the pilot and command's name? Were there any injuries or deaths on this aircraft? Where did you depart from? Where were you going? An idea of where the accident occurred. Any uh, circumstances around that accident that you can recall? Weather, you know, what was going on at the time that you were aware of? And, of course, a description of any explosives, radioactive materials, and other dangerous articles that you're carrying on board your balloon. All right, what does this all mean to you as balloon pilots? Well, a balloon accident is going to either consist of these few things. You're either going to have serious injuries or fatalities that occur, and or you're going to have the balloon sustains substantial damage. Now, what is substantial damage to a balloon? And that's the real question that a lot of people ask us when they're thinking about reporting, you know, their event to, to us. Okay, we consider da substantial damage as damage to any vertical or horizontal load tape. That means severing that load tape. Doesn't mean, to, you know, burning it a little bit or whatever. If it doesn't break, it's not a compromise of the major structure of the balloon. Unless, and this is the caveat, expressly excluded by the approved instructions for continued airworthiness for that particular make and model of balloon. And this is where you need to know what your ICAs are for your balloon because they will tell you whether your aircraft is airworthy or not. Also, what we might consider substantial Damage to the crown ring if it's outside the limits specified in the ICAs. Damage to any flying wires or suspension cables requiring major repair or replacement. Damage to more than one fabric panel above the equator. Damage to the basket support structure or skeleton requiring major repair or replacement. Damage to the basket floor outside the limits in the approved ICAs requiring major repair or replacement or damage to, and this is one that I get, you know, questions about all the time, carabiners or other attachment hardware between the flying wires or suspension cables and the basket. So this is what they teach us at the NTSB about balloons. Hi, NTSB investigator. This is a balloon. Look, it's got load tapes. It's got an equator. It's got a basket. It's got a mouth. We're trying to do a little bit better with our terminology and knowing more about ballooning. So actually in the next few years, our investigators are going to be going to Balloon Accident Investigation School to learn a little bit more about the ballooning community. I mentioned A blocks and pins, bayonet pins and carabiners. If you have damage to these, it's considered substantial depending on the ICAs, and we would consider that an accident investigation. Here's a case study of just one of these. We had a Cameron balloon. It impacted a power line. At least two fabric panels below the equator were damaged. There was no evidence of load tape damage on the envelope. There was arcing damage on the carabiners and molten metal and discoloration. So it melted one of the carabiners that was connecting the basket cables to the envelope. So, going through the damage that we looked at, panel damage was limited to less than 10% of the panels below the equator, so it was below the threshold for an accident. 
The carabiners that attached the basket to the envelope were questionable, so we went to the instructions for continued airworthiness on Cameron balloons, which specifically said that the carabiners are primary structural elements, replacement requires a logbook entry as such, and it's substantial damage, so we had to do an accident investigation on this particular activity. Here are some things that are not substantial damage. Damage limited to the scoop or the skirt of your balloon. Damage to less than 10% of the fabric below the equator with no damage to the load tapes. Damage to the sides or bottoms of your basket that do not affect the structural strength or skeleton, thank you, of the um, basket. Damage or failure of a burner which we equate to an engine. It's express, expressly excluded from part 830. So back to this picture. This was a small rally in Kansas a few years back. Pilot took off, encountered false lift, descended rapidly, got caught on this airport beacon. Question for you. There were no injuries. Is this an accident, an incident, reportable event, or nothing? Yes. The envelope was torn so much that major repair had to be done, and uh, it was an accident. This is an insult to you. This is the remains of the basket from Lockhart, Texas. Accident? Yes. Okay. And, of course, this was intent for flight, had people on board, impacted the power line, severed the cables, and, of course, the fatalities. You might note from this little white uh, panel there that this is a Kubasek balloon. Do you see the damage to the balloon? It's in the skirt. The ICA for this balloon indicates it's okay. It's nothing. You can legally fly with this. I guess the question you need to ask is, will your passengers feel comfortable doing that? Okay, what about this? We have a Kubasek balloon, looks intact, it's leaning, it's VFR, a breeze outside, we have people at the basket, people inside. Uh, looks like they're either taking off or landing. Is this an accident or is it nothing? It's an accident, and I'll tell you why. What happened in this, this happened in Ohio during this balloon fest last year. Pilot had landed, one of the people had gotten out of the basket to get the crown line to help deflate. What happened to these folks was, as they were getting ready to deflate, they caught a wind, the pilot fell into the burners and broke his neck. Very fluke accident. We found nothing wrong with the balloon. A uh, firefighter who was the guy who got out, of the got out of the balloon actually did CPR on him until they had the um, ambulance arrive, went to the hospital, pronounced dead. We looked at the balloon, 40 hours, nothing wrong with the systems. What did we learn from this? Situational awareness. Be sure you fly your balloon from start to finish. Make sure your gas is off, your envelope's off, vent lines, pulleys, all of this envelope on the ground. Passengers are disembarked, and you, the pilot, post-flight checklist complete. You know, something can happen to you in a perfectly good situation, so make sure that it doesn't stay alert, stay alive. So, wrapping up. <laughs> <laughs> I talked a little bit about the role of the NTSB, why we do investigations with balloons, what makes a balloon accident or incident a reportable event, what is considered substantial damage and what isn't with respect to a balloon, and can taxiing accidents become an accident? Yes, they can. If you want to read more about it, visit our website. Do you have any questions? Thank you for the five. <laughs> as far as reportable damage goes, damage to the fuel cylinders, is that reportable? I'm not sure. I really am not sure. You have to look at the, most likely if you compromise a fuel tank, you probably have more things going on that would probably get us involved. But if you pop the top of a hose and, you know, it breaks at the fitting or whatever, I don't think that's considered what we would call substantial damage is probably something that's easily repairable at your repair station and uh, whatever the ICA is for that particular balloon would probably govern that. Yes, ma'am? So we're always talking about accidents mostly that occur on landing or shortly after landing. Yes. What happens if you incur a substantial damage to your aircraft in the process of inflating or setting it up? I'm thinking if you burn through something, because we've all had those burns yes. on inflation. It's happened to me too. 
Are you, are you in the basket? Are your people in the basket? Pilate may be in the basket, may not be. That's the question. Yeah, are you in the basket? Is that stood up? And then you burn the panels. And then again, where did you burn the panels? And different balloons have different damage r restrictions, and you have to look at the ICAs. I fly an Aerostar. If I burn those panels while I'm stepping into the balloon, technically, per the ICAs, I can't fly that balloon. Other balloons can sustain other damage, and they can fly with certain panels burned as long as you don't burn through low tapes. So it just depends. So, so that we understand that, that that's damaged, but is that a reportable accident then or incident? You, could, report, you could report it, and then we go, mm-hmm, thank you very much, that's and right. send you on your way. Thank you. <laughs> because we have a lot to do. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, David. Another question? Question for Dave Bowling? Yeah. yeah. So from the slide, it looks like breaking an upright, which many people have done. Not that I've done this. But if it happened from that slide, it looked like that's reportable damage. Is that correct? Snapping an upright needs replacement. Thank you. I have never received a, a notification of just an upright breaking to be, we don't consider that substantial damage because where is the, what's, what is bearing the load on that balloon? Those, upright, those uprights are only holding up the burners, right? Yeah, the load is being bore by the carabiners and the cables that run under the, ca run under the basket and connect to the balloon, the flying wires. So those are your major structure. Those are not considered major structures, so we would not consider that an accident. Wouldn't even be a reportable event. So David will be around uh, for a little while afterwards if you still have more questions, but we don't want to get too far behind. So Mike is now going to talk about uh, information that he got about balloon accidents when looking at the NTSB accident database. Well, he will as soon as he gets mic'd up. So uh, it, again, we will have uh, our speakers around for a little while afterwards if you still have questions feel free to pr approach them on, on your own. Uh, however, since, okay. So, 17 years ago, uh, you all might remember a, uh, a video that Quad A put out called Hot Air and Hot Wires. And it was a safety video for avoiding power lines and what to do if you got into power lines. And it was a, 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 a big production uh, and it had a lot of great information. Uh, it was a little campy and we were thinking maybe we needed to do an update to that video. And we started looking into what we should present and we thought maybe we should review the accidents uh, and uh, that were actually reported to the NTSB to see if the assumptions we had met uh, our expectations. And uh, we found some interesting things. Uh, we, we actually compared the 17 years since the last video came out and the 17 years before that. Uh, and there are a lot of things we can learn. First of all, if you look back from 85 to 2002 in that 17 year period, there were 26 fatal balloon accidents. And in the following 17 years, went down slightly, 21 fatal accidents. The actual fatalities that occurred were 45 in the previous 17 years and 41 uh, since then. So, Statistically, it's uh, fairly consistent. It's, it's going in the right direction, but it's not dropping a lot. So we wanted to know what, what type of accidents occurred, and there were a couple of different ways we looked at this. Uh, one was by um, major factor, and what we found, uh, the largest one, not surprisingly, was power lines. Uh, but what was surprising was the next uh, most common, which is what I call post-landing pre-deflation. So that's you've, you've come down, you've landed, and for some reason you're waiting to deflate, whether that's waiting for crew or uh, 
conditions, or maybe you're thinking about moving to another location that's more convenient. Um, but that was 15% uh, in the, in the uh, 17 years prior to our last video. That's gone up to 24%, nearly a, quor a quarter of all fatal balloon accidents. You've already landed, you're safely down, and a quarter of the fatal accidents occur after that point. So that is something that I think we need to start looking at. Power line accidents have gone down since we released our last, our last video. Uh, the other things that are not surprising, hard landings, don't do hard landings, they do kill you. Uh, and unauthorized modification. Uh, when you do things to your propane system or you put a milk crate in to hold a, a propane tank and you have a hard landing, causes even more problems. We also looked at this by phase of flight. Now two of the categories stay the same. The unauthorized modification, you've decided to disregard safety long before you ever flew. So that's something you shouldn't do. But then there's the pre-flight decisions, and then the in-flight distractions, and then after you've landed, before you deflated. Uh, so in the 17 years before our last video, in-flight distractions was the major, major problem. And pre-flight decision-making was, again, about a quarter of the problems. Post-landing pre-deflation was only 15% back then, but that's gone up. In-flight distractions have gone down, people are paying attention more, but a lot of people are deciding to fly when they probably shouldn't have. So that's a trend we need to, to look at. But with a quarter of, uh, of all fatal accidents being in this, uh, this uh, post-landing, pre-deflation phase, we wanted to look at that in more, in more depth. So what are the typical scenarios that when you read the database, and, and I suggest each one of you go into the NTSB accident database, type in balloons for, t for category of aircraft, and just look at what's reported. It's fascinating, and there's a lot of it. Luckily, not as much as other general aviation, but it's very instructive. So after landing, but prior to deflation, an unexpected gust, dot, dot, dot comes up again and again. It also comes up in the non-fatal accidents. After landing but prior to deflation, the pilot and crew attempted to move the balloon to a more favorable spot. And then all types of hijinks occur. After landing but prior to deflation, the balloon rose unexpectedly, lifting a ground crew member into the air. This one almost always ends very badly. And, uh, and that's something as pilots we always need to understand the buoyancy. And this one surprisingly happens more than you would think. After landing but prior to deflation, the pilot exited the basket. So here are some of the actual reports. After landing on a hillside, the pilot waited for crew. Wind picked up and pushed the balloon back into the air. The basket struck a boat, a ladder on a truck rack, and the edge of a roof of the house. It's those kind of scenarios where deflating immediately is probably a better choice. You might not be in exactly where you want to be. Uh, maybe you have to do a little more crew activity to move it, uh, to get it packed up. But waiting for folks to arrive uh, is, is more hazardous than, than most of us would like. The pilot was attempting to reposition the balloon on the other side of a row of trees after landing, with another pilot acting as ground crew holding the drop line when the balloon rose unexpectedly. That pilot crew member held onto the drop line, eventually following, uh, falling from, from 100 feet. He did not survive that. That occurred up in Canada. It was referenced in the NTSB database without the details I had to contact uh, the Canadian uh, agency to get uh, the in-depth on that. Balloon landed and was about 90% deflated when a gust of wind caught the fabric. Basket tipped forward and one passenger slid out of the basket and sustained a, a serious injury. So even, even if you're trying to deflate rapidly, remember, until it's completely deflated, 
it's still like a sale, and it's, it's a significant risk. After landing, but prior to deflation, passengers and pilot all exited the balloon. As a low-flying airplane passed overhead, the balloon began to ascend. The pilot ran back to the balloon, grabbed onto the basket, and wrapped a rope around his leg. He actually, he actually claimed to his passengers, don't worry, I know a trick. He, uh, he rose up with the balloon, fell to about 80 feet, he died. He was a new pilot, but why did he leave the basket? Um, I was at a rally years ago, and I have a photographer uh, on my crew with a zoom lens, and she's just taking beautiful pictures, and all of a sudden, she says, Mike, look at this, and she shows me the screen. And I see a single pilot, no crew, had climbed out of his, his fully inflated hot balloon, and he's moving his balloon to a different location around a fence. I don't think that's allowed in anybody's uh, aircraft uh, uh, manual. So why is the post-landing pre-deflation phase so high risk? There's a sense of relief, especially on a, on a, a, a tricky day where the winds weren't cooperating. And you're finally down. You think, okay, now everything's going to be easy. But there's also a post-adrenaline slump. I mean, literally, all types of uh, hormone systems and endocrine systems are, are shutting down from that fight or flight. You're not as alert as you might be, and uh, it's a high-risk period for you, and also for your passengers. You're now low on fuel, so it's a lot easier to move that uh, basket over. You don't have the same weight. And it's like a sail. And remember, when you're, when you're at the end of the flight, you don't have a tie-off. You also probably are familiar with the place you took off from, but you often don't know much about where you've landed because you didn't necessarily plan to land there from the, from the beginning. So there are often hidden hazards nearby that you may not be aware of. Oftentimes, you have ad hoc crew who show up, which is great. I had ad hoc crew who showed up today. They were a highly trained, experienced crew, and that was wonderful. That's not always the case. Morning flights, well, as the morning is wearing on, that's when you're more susceptible to thermals kicking in. For those of you who fly more on the East Coast or other locations where uh, evening flights are, are the norm, the light is fading. So oftentimes you can't see what's coming up weather-wise or you may not see some power lines hidden the next lot over as the light's fading. So all of these contribute to, uh, to potential risks at that phase, phase of flight. There's a mindset that seems to contribute to waiting to deflate. Uh, and if, I think the, the, the one we all share is a lack of awareness of the high risk at this phase. I would never have guessed that, t that a quarter of all fatal accidents were due to this phase uh, until I started running the numbers. This one, I think, is shared by most of us. You want to deflate with an experienced crew presence, you know, present, a, a deployed crown line, the basket and balloon oriented to avoid hazards, you want it all to be just right, it's great to do that. But if you're waiting a significant period of time for all of that to line up, you're increasing the risk that you may experience. You also may want to help your crew find you. Well, there are apps for that. Use Glimpse, use something else. Call them on your cell phone. You can put your balloon down. There are ways to get a hold of a crew don't just leave it up to be a, a visible beacon. That's, that's an unnecessary risk. And this one, which was the, uh, the case for the, the pilot helping move the other pilot to the next lot over around a row of trees, you may be in an area that uh, it's, it's, you know, it's always nicer on the other, other side of the fence. Um, you, you think you're helping your crew out, but if you're doing that when you're running low on fuel and the winds are changing, it's not worth it. 
Years ago, I sat down in the North Valley. It was a lot that was going to be hard to get out of. I thought, I'll let one of my passengers out. I'll fly with a lighter load so that I won't use up my fuel. We'll find something. It's kind of light and variable. We were meandering around, kept missing good places. Eventually, I sat down on the berm just north of Paseo, right where the railroad tracks curve around. That wasn't too bad, except then the wind started picking up. That wouldn't have been so bad, but I had a light load. So it's inching me up the berm, headed towards Paseo. I can't, I can't put it down because the balloon would drape on Paseo. I'm just hoping that my crew gets there in time. Why didn't I just deflate way back over in that inconvenient field and deal with that? That would have been a better choice. I learned that lesson a long time ago. Um, you can learn from my mistakes. And then, of course, something we all do, the, the assumption that the weather conditions which prevail during the flight will continue well past your delayed deflation. And it's when we're so oblivious to what's actually happening that our guard is down. So that's sort of a double whammy. And complacency. If, if you've done this 50, 100, 1,000 times, and you haven't had a problem, you tend to think that you won't have a problem. That complacency is not unique to balloonists. I'm also an aerospace engineer. And when I read reports from NASA about we had a problem with an O-ring, but it didn't cause a fatality with the space shuttle, so why will it now cause a fatality? The same thing with the foam falling off of the insulation on the fuel tank. It didn't cause a fatality then, it's fine. Well, that complacency led to losing two space shuttles. The behaviors that, that increase the severity in these post-landing pre-deflation actions. If you're not holding on to your vent, uh, vent line, ready to deflate at a moment's notice, that's a problem. Every time one of those buoyant balloons went up and a crew member dropped, it was because the pilot was unaware of his buoyancy and he was not prepared to act sufficiently to correct that immediately. Don't be one of those pilots. Always be ready for that. A lot of times, the passengers are all relaxed because you made it safely down. They've let go. They're not braced. They think all of the risk is over at that point. Emphasize to your passengers to continue to hold on. Even though everything's calm, hold on until everything is deflated. False lift. Uh, that gets so many pilots. Uh, and if it's, it's calm, you're fine, but all of a sudden the gust comes along, false lift picks you up, causes all types of problems. And your ground crew. They're happy that you're down. They're happy that you're safe. Remind them that you're not really down. It's not really over until it's over. Everyone focus till you're fully deflated. And hopefully, everyone focus until everything's packed up on the trailer or the truck. And this one happens. Crew all of a sudden running, doing uh, their, uh, their weight on uh, position. They leave that to go grab a crown line and uh, haven't paid attention to what's going on. And boom, all of a sudden you're rising. Don't let that happen. Really focus on communication. If you change your focus to deflate as soon as possible, you can change that culture. Adjust where you're going to land, thinking I'm landing there because I am going to lay down immediately. Don't Choose your, your, your postage stamp uh, spots as your first choice. Save that for an emergency. Never, ever, ever exit a balloon prior to deflation. Don't add to those statistics. And if you really have to reposition, keep your crew focused. So land right away. This time, I think that was uh, just uh, north of General Mills years ago. We're stuck inside. Uh, the fence at the ballpark, no obvious way in or out. I think the gates were locked, but the winds were strong. We put it down. 
We burped it ourselves, waited for the crew. We got it out eventually, but it was the safe thing to do. But we also found one other interesting statistic. So back in February, I was down in Queensland, Australia. And, uh, well, as you know, everything on, that's down under, it's, it, everything's upside down, it's backwards there, it's kind of crazy. Um, things hop, a lot of things hop. They were bouncing all around. Um, this was a particularly cute wallaby, so I thought I'd show it to you. But uh, they also, they, they drive on the left. And uh, that sign is obviously for Americans, because uh, if you're noticing that sign that's a problem, you should be on the other side so you don't smack into that uh, car. I've been driving on the right side of the road for 37 years. But when you drive down there, you have a steering wheel that's on the right side, but not everything is flipped. Some things are the pedals are the same as we have, but the turn signal is on the right side. The windshield wi wiper activator is on the left side. It took me three days to stop activating the windshield wiper every time I wanted to make a turn. I am not kidding. What does that have to do with ballooning? Muscle memory, exactly. This is especially important to high hour pilots flying new to you balloons. If you're used to flying a racer or a regular shaped balloon or a special shaped balloon and you switch, but you have a thousand hours in that one, all types of things change. They cool off quickly for a smaller balloon. It cools off slowly for a large balloon. Longer burns for level flight, shorter burns for level flight. I mean, each one of these things is a nonlinear uh, aspect. You may be focusing on one of them, but you're used to it performing differently. So keep that in mind that no matter how hard you may try, if you've got 3,000 hours in one one type and you're shifting to another type of balloon, it's especially hazardous and we found a lot of those kinds of accidents cropping up in the database. So, uh, wait, wait, why is it go going through twice for some reason? There we go. So, just use extra caution in that situation. Okay, it's going to take a minute. It's going to take a minute for Rob to get up here and to get uh, set up. So uh, if you have questions while, while Rob is getting set up for, for Mike, then uh, please go ahead and ask him while Rob is getting ready. And here's Rob. Hi. Um, interesting. Mike and I have not talked maybe three minutes total on this. A lot of things I was going to say, he said for me, so appreciate that, Mike. A um, couple things since I have a cop captive audience here. This is totally off what I'm, my discussion is. If you or anybody you know drop skydivers, check with your insurance company f before you do it again to make sure what coverage you have, if you have any coverage. <laughs> So all second thing, additional insureds, things are changing. Additional insured is not what it used to be. Every state could be a little different than the next state. So talk to an attorney or somebody that knows additional insureds to make sure you're doing the right thing because you could be signing off some of your coverage and your policy. Okay, I got the call to come up here and talk about claims, things that have happened that are unusual, things the NTSB would not know, and uh, I've got some good stories. Um, probably my best story, not that best, but 10 years ago, <laughs> what? Would you, already you done something? <laughs> oh, what? That's okay. That used to be me. Um, about 10 years ago, Monday morning, 9.05, phone rings. 
guy from California. Rob, need to file a claim. Okay, I need to do it right now. Okay, I gotta be at court in two hours. I said, really? Um, did I know about this? I didn't do anything wrong. I said, I said, did I know about this? He said, no, it was two years ago, but I didn't do anything wrong. I said, well, somebody thinks you did. <laughs> You're gonna be at court in two hours. Ended up that this guy had knocked down a telephone pole with telephone wires and he wouldn't pay it and claimed it wasn't his fault. Never turned it in to anybody. 1600 bucks. The insurance company did pay it. But I was thinking, why wouldn't you do that? I mean, if that would have been a big claim, he would have been out of luck because they would have walked away. They would have walked away. Claims that I get that NTSB had a guy call me. Rob, I was driving my truck in Arizona out in the desert, pick up, looked in the back, and the balloon was on fire. I said, really? Okay. What'd you do? He said, I got out and ran away. It's a smart move. <laughs> Told him that this was not, a, not an aircraft accident, but the balloon burned up. He had all coverage, so he had a claim. So when you say, why are my insurance rates high? Things like this happen, and you're like, wow, how would that happen? And he never could understand why the fire happened, but it did. I have notes. Something that Mike really hammered in on, landing. About three years ago, John and I noticed when we were with THE, it seemed to be a significant increase in claims for balloons after they landed. And we found out, we did some investigation, and it was about 30% of the claims were things that happened, like I landed here, but I really wanna be over there where the pickup truck is, so let's walk it over. Well, they walk over, well, somebody steps in a gopher hole, breaks her leg, balloon goes up, gets, you know, nobody, it's a claim, it's a claim. So to confirm, I called THE last week and asked them, still 30% after the balloon lands. To my suggestion, and I didn't like this when I used to fly actively, when you land the balloon, take it down. I've heard Mike say many times, that gust of wind. It's always that gust of wind comes up and something happens and something, makes, and something goes wrong. So if you have to carry it an extra 100 yards, carry it an extra 100 yards, but get the balloon down. That's really important. A lot of, maybe some of you here, I get a lot of calls. Rob, I, I hit a car when I landed. Nobody got hurt. The driver wasn't there. I left a note on the windshield. Claims filed. Remember, when a claim gets filed, all this costs money because claims people are working Insurance companies located in Florida, and this is an Oregon claim. They hire a claims company out there, so all this costs money. A lot of vehicle claims like that. We had one out here a couple of years ago. It hit an Airstream trailer, right, crease right across the top. Stuff is not cheap. Animals. Has anybody here ever had an animal claim? Nobody? We get five at one time. Had the, the, the horn had broken off the sheep because he got scared when the balloon flew over. The pigs all got out of a pig barn because the balloon flew over. So many things like, and they all want money and we have to go out and hire an adjuster. Normally we don't pay animal claims because there's so many things that could make cow stampede or things happen, but you still have to follow through with them. You still have to follow through. Another one is taking balloon off the truck. 
I was, remember the, the flight starts when you take the balloon off the truck and it ends when you put it back. Taking the balloon off the truck, it fell on the guy, hurt his back real bad. Big claim, I don't think it was ever filed with the NTSB because nothing really had happened yet, but it was still a claim with the insurance company. Years ago, balloon landed on the side of a mountain. Couldn't get it off. So they were walking out. One of the passengers stumbles, really bad sprained ankle. Wasn't reported as an accident, but it was still a claim for the balloon because the balloon wasn't in the truck yet. In fact, the balloon wasn't in the truck till the next day. But still, it is a claim. So these are, these are things that come up all the time, even little things. And then going back to this moving the balloon after it's landed, so many guys I know, you know you're walking the balloon along and you stop, but the envelope doesn't. Keeps going. It might have a power line, a tree, a house. Uh, Again, Mike, whatever you said, there's a lot of stuff I was going to say because it's all true. This after landing claims and fatalities, I didn't know it was that high, are really been going up. So I could just say be on top of your game until the balloon is in the truck and you're done. Something else that can happen, and this all falls into, um, I guess, talking to the passengers and so forth, don't get out of the balloon until I tell you. I had a situation myself once where I landed, and all four people jumped out. And I just, it was a raven. I pulled the red line, and that was it. And I thought, what were you people doing? Because I told them not to do it, but they were so excited because we landed somewhere that they were familiar with. So that kind of, that kind of stuff can happen any time. You just always need to be careful. Um, there's so many claims. The vehicle claim thing has been big, but right now my big my deal, as with Mike said, when you land the balloon, take it down. Um, and always, Rob, this gust of wind came. It's always that. So really, with Mike, with what Mike said, and what I have to say, I can take some questions, but uh, there's a lot of strange claims out there. And if you get a claim, if you have a claim, Report it. Don't had a guy. I had a guy call me yesterday. He would hit a car. Twenty five hundred dollars to fix it. Should he file the claim or not? I said file it. It's in your policy. You got to file that claim because in six months one of his passengers could come back and say I got hurt during that accident, and if he hadn't filed the claim, the insurance company is not going to go into his defense. And a lot of times. I see letters come out six months, a year later, from an attorney, who's this? I don't remember that flight. You know, my husband hurt his leg or can't have sex anymore. Or my wife won't get in a car. It's such bizarre stuff. So you always want to make sure, if you, th if you even think there's a claim, let the insurance company know about it. Does anybody have any questions on anything except lottery numbers? Who are you, sir? <laughs> Mr. Gary Moore. I know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey, Rob, uh, someone told me that crew standing up on the edge of a basket, you know, putting things together and all that, that in the insurance policy that might not be covered. Is that, is that true? So you're saying if a crew member gets injured? Yes, standing up he, on the edge he, of the he, basket. He's, in the, he's covered. He's okay. covered. All he's right. covered. Okay. As a passenger, even if like even if he would fall on a gopher hole, and, and he's he's covered. Somebody else has a question here. Come on. No questions. Got one over here. Can you give us an explanation of hull coverage? They're saying in hull coverage. Hull coverage would be your. Envelope, basket, tanks, fan, it's rope, that's accessories. That will be haul. 
So if you had a balloon, say a $30,000 balloon, you would have insured for 30, and you would have put $5,000 on accessories, you would have a $35,000 haul coverage, and it's all risk haul. It's covered all the time. Like the guy that had the fire in the pickup truck, he had haul, he was covered. Yes? I'm, well, I'm sorry, I got a waiver. Always have a waiver signed. You should always have a waiver signed. There's a reason for that. If you have a major big time claim, a waiver isn't gonna go very far. But if you have a waiver and a frivolous claim comes up or, hey, you know, let's go after that balloon guy. He's a rich guy, he has a balloon. Well, no, we signed that waiver. That's sort of what that's for. It's a preventive measure to keep people from coming after you. If, they, if you have a big time claim, the waiver's really not gonna do anything for you. Uh, I would say it depends on what state you're in, whatever the statute of limitations is in that state. Like if it's four years, keep it for four years. Because you don't know how many guys call me and say, hey, I got this letter, and they go through stacks of waivers until they find the one they need. Oh, he asked about a waiver. How long should you keep a waiver? How long is a waiver good? So if a passenger rides one time and then six months later, and then six months later, is that okay. first waiver still good? We always recommend have a waiver always signed by your crew like once a year. You don't want to have a waiver with like, hi, I'm Bill Smith, and have eight people sign it. Every individual person should sign the waiver, their own waiver. That answer your question? Got a couple more. You can put your balloon in a limited liability company or a corporation, but does that do anything to protect the pilot individually from liability? Uh, is it your, your, are you the pilot or are you flying for somebody else? Or? I, I'm the pilot and I'm flying for a limited liability company that I own. Gives you one more little level of protection that a, the lawyer will be, but the state you were in is where you want to go to really answer that question because every state has different kind of laws. Thank you. Is there ever an age of a balloon where you will stop insuring it if it continues to be airworthy? For a balloon to be insured, it has to pass annual. If you fly a balloon and does not have an annual and have an accident, you have no coverage. As far as the waiver, so we have to sign a waiver the like the first time they crew for us each year and just have them sign like the date as the December 31st of that year. Does that cover them for the whole year as our crew? Could you repeat that a little bit? Cl cl <laughs> I'm sorry. So our waiver crew, we have our crew sign the first time they crew for us in the year, we have them sign the waiver and sign December 31st of that year. Is that we have them covered for the whole year? Yeah, I would just, as long as you have, as long as your crew signs a separate waiver, at least once a year so they're covered um, you should be okay with that I mean, always have your pass and your sign for waiver uh, one last story I'll tell you um, had a fellow fairly close to here was taking four people out for a balloon ride and they were asking questions a lot of questions that weren't normal like how do we collect if something happens and you know, just questions that he, he wasn't comfortable with. So he stopped the van and he said, we're not going on this balloon ride because you're asking questions that I don't like and I feel like I'm being set up and he took them back. There's a lot of people out there looking for money now and a lot of, everybody, everybody thinks that you people are all real rich and you know better, but the general public doesn't. So there's some people like to get some frivolous lawsuits if they can. Appreciate you having me here, it was fun. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. We're gonna take a, a 15 minute break now. We do have 
Uh, more cookies on the side here. We still have a few brownies left. Obviously no coffee, but we do have uh, water left. Again, feel free to visit the, the uh, book sales over between the two doors here.